Mathematics is unique in how its practitioners insist on absolute proof. Not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but proof beyond any doubt, past, current, or even yet to come. To achieve these levels of rigor, the wicked mathematician uses a variety of incantations, from a proof by minimal counterexample to the extremely rare proof by just look at it. And a brand new proof by just look at it just dropped on the r slash math subreddit and I thought the whole thing was pretty amusing. So we'll take a look through this elegantly and simply stated prove that the formula for the volume of a sphere is incorrect and we'll look at some of the math, some related results, and some of the amusing comments. And why don't we bust out our best sharpie to take some notes while we read through this. So the argument starts with, the, of course, the volume of a sphere, 4 times pi times r cubed over 3. I'll write this as Vs for volume of a sphere with radius R, of course. If you're in school and you have one of those old school assignment book calendars, a lot of times they would have a catalog of mathematical formulas at the start or at the end, and they would always have this, the volume of a sphere, four thirds pi times the radius cubed. All right, let's read on. The next bullet point is just a uh, approximation. We'll get back to that. It's not super important right now. Then imagine the sphere were inscribed within a cube such that it is tangent to it at exactly six points. So we're talking about a situation like this. We have this cube and inscribed within the cube, just touching all six of its faces is this sphere. Because of the geometrical arrangement here, we thus know the side length of the cube. By definition, the distance from the center of the sphere out to here where it touches the cube's face is the radius of the sphere r. And of course we could also go the other direction to the point where it touches the other face and that distance is also r. We thus see that the side length of the cube, which would be this whole distance, is 2r. With that in mind, the simply stated prove goes on to calculate the volume of the cube in terms of that radius r. So let's do that. The volume of a cube, we'll write vc, is the side length cubed. The side length we've just established of our cube is two times the radius r of that inscribed sphere. So that's the side length, we have to cube it, two cubed is eight, and r cubed we will leave as r cubed of course. Now this is where the approximation becomes relevant to run a sort of back of the napkin calculation. We're interested in how the volume of the sphere inscribed in the cube relates to the volume of the cube. Well, we know the volume of the cube is 8 r cubed, and the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we would like just a simple idea of how big this number is, 4 thirds pi, to see how it compares to 8. A well-known approximation for pi is 22 sevenths, so let's say we use that approximation. So the volume of the sphere is about 4 thirds times 22 sevenths times the radius cubed. Multiplying these fractions, 4 times 22 is 88, and 3 times 7 is 21. And it's easy to see that 88 over 21 is a bit bigger than 4. 21 times 4 is 84, so there's 4 left over, so this is just a little bit bigger than 4. So then we could say an approximation of the volume of the sphere, well, it's around 4r cubed. Then, again, the ratio we're really interested in is how the volume of the sphere compares to the volume of the cube. Well, we see from our approximation, the volume of the sphere divided by the volume of the cube, well, the r cubes would cancel out, and so our approximation is that it would be about 4 over 8, or about 1 half. This is the mathematically sound argument our esteemed Redditor makes. You can see here he's saying how the sphere inscribed would be about half the volume. However, we have erred, for it should be immediately obvious that this cannot possibly be the case, and to figure that out, you just have to look at the picture uh, which he is linked, which is a picture to the sphere inscribed in the cube. Just look at it. Clearly, the sphere occupies a much larger volume than just half of the cube. The sphere's almost taking up the whole thing. There's just some little nooks and crannies here that are still empty, so obviously these formulas are incorrect. 
the formulas have to be wrong because all of the math we did here was fine. So the formulas we've been taught, well, apparently it turns out they were just rough approximations. Those formulas don't actually give the exact values, otherwise we wouldn't have this contradiction. Now I'll let you guess the reception that this prove got on the subreddit. Again, we'll look at comments in a minute, but uh, yeah, so there's nothing wrong with this math. This is all perfectly valid. The picture just doesn't give you a very good intuitive idea of the ratio of volumes here. Sometimes it can be hard to accept that your eyes are just out right lying to you, although in this case I think it's easier to accept that than most. For example, if we look at the 2D situation here, things are a lot more straightforward. Here's a square and here's my best attempt at an inscribed circle. The circle has radius r and so the side lengths of the square are 2r. Thus, the ratios of what are in this case areas is pi r squared for the circle divided by 2r squared, which is 4r squared for the square. And we can quickly say, well, pi is a bit over three, so this is a bit over three fourths. So this is around 0.75. The circle, according to the math, should take up about 75% of the square's area. And our eyes confirm that. We look at this and it's, yeah, that looks like around 75% of the area taken up by the inscribed circle. We can get an accurate idea just by looking at it, but this is because it's a 2D drawing of a 2D figure. It's much, much more difficult to get an accurate view of volume when you're observing it based on a 2D printout or even just a 2D image of a three-dimensional situation. If you actually had the privilege to gaze upon a real ball in a real box, this result for the ratio would probably not be as surprising. But even still, the shapes involved, these awkward corners cut off by the sphere, are just a little bit more difficult to amass in your head to try to guess an accurate idea at the ratio. We'll look at another very famous example of this in a minute. Let's look at those red comments. Sometimes I feel like people take this stuff way too seriously. So one guy links the original poster, a video that demonstrates what I just described, a real sphere and a real cube. It's a great volume demonstration. I'll link it in the description. In response to that link, someone says, pretty nice of you to even perform YouTube searching services for this person. And the original poster says, this person? What kind of person would this person be exactly? The OP, of course, is a little taken aback by the negative response response from the math subreddit, because mathematicians are viewed as a very skeptical community. Of course, we accept nothing less than absolute proof for everything. But after asking for his kind to be described, someone else absolutely goes off on him. The kind of person we're talking about is a person too lazy to do the basic searching on YouTube. The kind of person we're talking about isn't humble enough to stop for a moment to imagine how much of the modern world depends on this equation being correct, and to then consider the possibility that they are missing something. The kind of person who won't point out a single flaw in any one of the proofs that might exist to derive the equation for the volume of a sphere. Sorry, you asked what kind of person, so that's the kind of person we're talking about. It's a good write-up, it's pretty funny, I totally understand both perspectives here. Like I said, the OP understandably expects the math community to be understanding of skepticism, but I have no doubt that the various math-related subreddits deal with stuff like this all the time, where someone comes and says, hey guys, sorry to say, but one of the most basic results in your field is actually wrong, and none of you have been smart enough to notice. I think it's pretty clear this guy was just a little confused about his intuition leading him astray and wanted some more clarification, but some of his wording I think definitely irritated people like this here. <laughs> My favorite comment though is this one. This one's hilarious. Here's a list of phrases you used. Immediately obvious. Cannot possibly. Just look at them. Clearly, apparently, here's your list of evidence. And of course there's nothing. It's the rare and elusive proof by emphatic assertion. Okay, okay, back to some math. What if instead of inscribing a sphere in a cube, we inscribed a sphere in a cylinder? What proportion of the cylinder's volume would be taken up by the sphere? It certainly, again, looks like most of the cylinder's volume is taken up by the sphere. Maybe it's four fifths, maybe 80%, something like that. But again, it only kind of looks that way because we're seeing areas, but we're trying to imagine the volumes represented by this 2D print. In 
In around 225 BCE, Archimedes published a two-volume treatise titled On the Sphere and Cylinder. In this legendary work, Archimedes was the first to resolve this problem of what portion of the cylinder the inscribed sphere takes up. The volume of the sphere we know is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Because this sphere is inscribed in the cylinder, the radius of the circles that make up the top and base of the cylinder, those circles also have that radius of r, which is common to the sphere. And the height of the cylinder also has to be a radius of the sphere plus another radius of the sphere. So using VC once more, but this time for volume of the cylinder, the volume of a cylinder is the volume of the circular base, which is pi r squared, scaled up by the height, which is often written as h. In this case, the radius of the cylinder is the same as that r radius of the sphere, and h is actually 2r. The height is two times the radius. So this becomes 2 pi r cubed. So what portion of the cylinder's volume is taken up by the inscribed sphere? Well, it's this over this. The pi r cubes would cancel out, so it would be 4 thirds divided by 2. 4 thirds divided by 2 is the same as 4 over 6, which reduces to 2 thirds. Archimedes was so pleased with this result that he asked for it to be inscribed on his tombstone. So in this case, our visual estimation was correct in that the sphere takes up more than half of the cylinder, but it was hard to see that it would be two thirds. At a glance, it really looks like the sphere takes up more than two thirds because it's hard to appreciate the volume of the nooks and crannies that are left empty. For students studying geometry, whether for better or for worse, it is in fact often required Required that you do a proof by just look at it. Here's such an example with a fifth grade math problem I saw online recently. I'll leave a link in the description. To solve this problem, you have to do a little bit of proof by just look at it. I'll show you quickly the solution and see if you can find the part where we have to make an assumption. So we're trying to find the area of this shaded figure, which consists of two overlapping triangles. That's pretty straightforward then. All we have to do is find the area of the two triangles, add them together, and then subtract the area of their intersection, which would have been counted twice. The area of a triangle is one half base times height, so the area of this triangle on the left is one half times the base, which is nine, times the height, which is eight centimeters plus four centimeters for a total of 12 centimeters. So the area of the triangle on the left then is one half multiplied by nine multiplied by 12. One half times 12 is six, six times nine is 54. Then the triangle on the right, again, one half base times height, the height is also 12 and the base is also nine. So again, it would just be 54. Okay, so adding the areas of the two triangles together, we have two times 54, which is 108, and then we need to subtract the area of their intersection because we don't want to count that area twice. The area of the intersection, well, that's also a triangle, so one half base, which is nine centimeters, one half times nine, times the height, that's why we have this little four here that's telling us the height of the intersection point, which would be the height of this triangle. So one half times nine times four, one half times four is two times nine is 18. Taking 18 away from 108, we arrive at a final answer of 90 centimeters squared. And indeed, if someone was really drilling me on the details here, I would have to do a little bit of proof by just look at it. Just look at it. This is a rectangle. It's got to be. Otherwise, we don't know what the height is. We need this to be a 90 degree angle so that this is giving us the heights of the triangles. Furthermore, we have to use a proof by just look at it in order to conclude that both of the triangles have this as the base. It's easy enough to be sure that one triangle has this as the base just because of what we see being shaded. But how do we know this other triangle also has that as its base? It's easy to imagine that this side of the triangle continues on to this point, but it may be in fact that it stops right here and the actual base looks like that. In which case, the nature of this second triangular region would not be quite as simple as it appears. But at the level of fifth grade, this degree of diagram skepticism is not super important, expected, 
or probably appreciated. Another really classic triangle result that you could convince yourself of by just look at it that's actually true is the triangle inequality. For example, here's a triangle with side lengths, let's say A, B, and C. I might ask, how do the side lengths of A and B compare to C if we add them up? A plus B, how does that compare to C? Well, just look at it. Obviously, A and B have to be at least as long as C. That's because A and B together get us from the start of C to the end of C. But whereas C does it in this straight shot, A and B do not. So certainly together, they are at least as long as C. And for any proper triangle, the sum would be greater than C. Life really is a delicate dance of using your intuition to lead you to solutions and a healthy degree of skepticism and making assumptions to try to understand an author correctly. And yeah, it's easy for our eyes to lie to us with volumes, but that's because those are 3D situations. You you take a simple 2D situation like this and it's obvious that the first arch is smaller than the oh the 